You might think that the top echelon of bodybuilding is just a chemical warfare. It's about who can load the biggest 5cc syringe, stick it in their glutes in the most days in a row to get the results required. For a very small plastic trophy, nothing that's super notable by the grand majority of the world's population, to each their own, but you could be right. Look, there's a lot of bodybuilders who have talked about extremely insane dosing protocols that honestly, I don't even comprehend. Like, I don't know how I'd put that much oil in my body. Chase Irons is doing his 20,000 nanograms per deciliter experiment, which requires him to shoot like three plus cc's a day of gear. And I don't know about you, but this is something I could never do. And I admire anyone who has the willpower to do this. What are the guys doing at the Olympia level? Are, are they doing any anything in particular that's super unique compared to what you or I would be running. And if there are differences within what they're doing, what is it? What exactly makes them so special? Well, Dorian Yates kind of cracks open a little bit more than he's ever done before and tells us more about what cycles he ran during his heyday. And for those of you who don't know, Dorian was for sure one of the biggest bodybuilders in his era. The man had seismic proportions compared to many bodybuilders of this era, and he was known for making part particularly rapid transformations, which he did here from 1992 to 1993 with an insane amount of muscular progression, but a minimized amount of fat gain. I mean, this is a crazy, crazy rate of progression. His arms look like they grew three fucking inches on each side. Well, like I said, Dorian Yates has opened up a little bit more to let us know what he's running exactly, and that is exactly what I want to go through today. See what doses he was running, compounds, and generally what his off-season and prep looked like. Well, it was a progressive thing. Here's, here's the thing, right? Um, it makes sense to take the minimum amount to get the maximum effect. Yeah? And the first course I took was 20 milligrams a day of, of d bol And I got amazing effects because I've never taken anything before. And then progressively over a few years, you know, it got to be mm. a, bit, a bit more and a bit more. And there is an argument for like, you probably need more doses as you get bigger because you're going to have more receptors, more muscle mass and so on. So keep that in mind. But by the time I got to the Olympia in the off season, in the off season, I generally took a bit more because I wasn't concerned about, you know, really trying to stay in shape. Yeah. It was just, it was my off season I'm training heavy I'm training you know I don't mind if I'm carrying a bit yeah. of water and everything so I would say like probably maximum 2,000 milligrams total and I wouldn't do that for more than probably five weeks and then I taper down and a couple of weeks off and go on again so it was not constant at that dose that would probably be like a thousand milligrams testosterone wouldn't really go much over that on the test and some Deca or Boulder known, something yeah. like that good old D-Ball my favourite occasionally I used uh, Anadrol it's an Apollon the 50 yeah. milligram ones but uh I mean, people say they're toxic, but they're also 50 milligrams. So if you take two or three a day, that's 100, 150 milligrams going through your liver. I think even if it was Anavar or Winstrol, it'd probably be also problematic. That's one where I didn't really feel great. I mean, you feel great in the gym, you feel very powerful, yeah. but uh, it tends to push your blood pressure up and you tend to feel just a vague feeling of not really feeling that great outside the Lethargic. Gym. Yeah, lethargic, not that great. Where D-Ball, you kind of feel a bit, bit euphoric, I suppose. A lot to take part there uh, and decompartmentalize. One, there is obviously a push in the off season. So I think most bodybuilders at the upper levels are actually running more in their off seasons than they do in their preps. And this is pretty common, at least for maybe lower level competitors. I'm not talking to the top 10 Olympians, but I'm talking to a lot of people who are competing in the Olympia, but not at the top 10. I, I guess to be honest, it's, it's very common. You usually see people titrate doses in the off season. Why would this be compared to a prep? Well, using conventional logic, it's pretty easy because if you're in a hyper caloric environment, meaning you're eating more calories than you need to be consuming, your body is in a very anabolic state in general. And then if you throw on more anabolics, you're going to grow a copious amount of muscle. Now keep throwing on more, keep fueling the fire with a lot of calories, and you will linearly grow at some point. But when you're in a prep, it's a little bit different. You don't have as many calories to play with. You're in a hypocaloric diet, and therefore it's a lot harder to grow even if you can grow at all. And so blasting the doses in the preparation for a show is just a really ineffective way to use or leverage any form of PED or anabolic. It's honestly kind of a waste of money. And that doesn't mean you have to go down to zero milligrams during a prep because you still want to retain muscle and develop a certain kind of look on your exterior. But it doesn't mean that you need to blast as much as you do in your off season to sustain the results that you've gotten from your off season. Because the goal ultimately is in the off season to grow a copious amount of muscle. And while you are prepping, it is to just sustain that muscle that you've grown. So 
lasting in the off season a bit higher than you would in the preparation is sort of the rule of thumb. It makes the most sense long term. Where he said he was using about 2000 milligrams. Is this true? Is this not true? It's really hard to say. From what he's talking about here, it sounds like for the most part, he took one gram of testosterone and then a mixture of about a gram of another anabolic, so equipoise or angelone from what he said. And then obviously in that somewhere too, to get up that 2000 milligrams, he was using an oral compound, whether that was D-ball or Inadrol. It seems like he preferred more of the D-ball route, which is actually interesting and less of the Inadrol route, but he seems to have taken both interchangeably. Is that an accurate dosing? It's very likely, I'm going to be honest, he's obviously very genetically driven towards growth. I mean, there's a reason he was the biggest bodybuilder on stage, and it wasn't because he was taking the most amount of drugs. I would almost guarantee that there was competitors on that stage. In fact, I know there was competitors on their stage because they've talked about it where they've openly taken five grams. I think Nasser was one of the people that very clearly talked about taking five gram cycles on a weekly basis for pretty much his entire career. Some people say that was a troll that he used to do that and stuff, but I, I don't know. I'm just going to kind of take his word for it. And here I wouldn't disagree that this is maybe what Dorian had taken, but I also would say that maybe he forgot because realistically the cycling of these hormones is kind of crazy. Busting up to two grams for five weeks and then coming off for just a few weeks and then busting back up to two grams for a few weeks, you're basically on cycle year round. So he was doing this for his entire career. Makes sense why he would only need 2000 milligrams because he never truly came off of androgens. He just came off of injecting for a few weeks, but all of the androgens that he was injecting were still very obviously in his blood serum and didn't go anywhere. So what you have here are two models, right? And essentially the left model is the blasting and cruising model, which is what we're so used to as an industry. We use this model all of the time. Basically we blast and then we cruise. We have a period where calories and androgens are generally a lot higher and we have a period where they're a lot lower, which is our cruising period. This makes sense. This model works, but the issue lies in Dorian's model because <laughs> legitimately the, the androgens would have never came out of his system fully. Like he would have, he would have stayed on them the entire time that he was blasting. There, the, the few weeks in between cycles wouldn't have been enough for them to completely clear out of a system to even a degree that was measurable, let alone completely. So essentially what he was doing is there was just a full length blast. And let's say this timeline was three years compared to, you know, the new sort of era of bodybuilding. This was more of what his cycles would look like. So maybe he had used two grams and because he never really came off, he progressed at a much quicker rate. Whereas someone who used two grams at an average over, let's just say the span of a year was on total less milligrams because of their cruising periods where Dorian was just blasting all the way fucking through and never really came off. So there is a plausibility to what he's saying being true. I don't deny it. I wouldn't doubt that Dorian is a unique individual in and of himself and that his genetic proclivity to respond to drugs is really good. I've had clients who respond insanely to very minimal amounts of dosage and I've had other clients who just need a copium of androgens to respond even a little bit. So I think everyone's a bit unique in this capacity. What you should take away from this is ultimately that it doesn't fucking matter. Uh, you are going to need something much different than Dorian. I'm going to need something much different than you. And Dorian is going to need something much different than you or I. It doesn't really matter. You are your own experiment at the end of the day. And your journey is yours alone. And this is what makes bodybuilding so difficult is because everyone looks for a blueprint, but they fail to realize that they are their own blueprint. Unfortunately, this this often leads them down a very, very negative path where they get negative reinforcement saying that I cannot progress. There's no way I can progress. But ultimately, maybe the fact of the matter is, is that they're unique and in a different capacity, they need to do something, but they just don't do it because it's simply not a blueprint. Yet. And that's why you should join a Discord group. Talk about things like this all the time. Provide free training programs, free dietary programs, sources, all the good stuff that you might need to be successful in your day to day. That's all she wrote, folks. If you like this video, tell me down below, like, comment, and even hit that little notification bell button because it does help a tremendous amount. But before you go, watch this video right here.